Today, we're going to be discussing California legal updates for the year 2021. You're going to be able to apply what you learned and use it for the private security industry, especially private security officers can use it, private patrol operators can use this information, and so can private investigators. Here's my disclaimer. As you know already, I am not an attorney. None of the content here represents any legal or professional advice. Not doing your own research can result in costly legal decisions against you. I do not represent any government entity, law enforcement agency, including the Bureau of Security Investigative Services, also known as BSIS. You're going to catch me a couple of times glancing down at the screen, and that is because I am. I have to look at the screen because there's some very important information that I don't want to miss. I want you to get the most important parts of this presentation, and I can only do so by looking at the screen. First bill is AB 1512, and that was codified in Labor Code 226.7, covers security officer arrest period rules. This was authored by Wendy Carrillo. She's a Democrat. Why do I mention the name for you? Well, the reason why I mention the name is because I want you to be able to thank this person for passing the bill or give them a no thanks for passing it. It's up to you. And when I mean passing, I mean passing the bill to the governor to get it signed. Okay. So AB 1512 only pertains to you guys who are under a collective bargaining agreement. So if you're a labor union, this law probably pertains to you. If you're not sure about whether or not you're in a labor union, you're probably not in a labor union. If you get some deductions on your paycheck and you don't know what's going to, well, see if it's going to a labor union or association. It might say labor union association. It's a line item that should be on your paycheck. You are then you belong to a collective bargaining agreement. You normally know when you're in a collective bargaining agreement or labor union when you get hired. Okay, so this law requires officers to remain on site and on call and to monitor their communication devices during rest periods. There was a case law that came out. It's Augustus versus ABM Security Services, and it's a 2016 law. And in that case, security officers were not being compensated for having an interrupted break. And as a result here, they, they drew a lawsuit and it looks like ABM security services had to pay out. It's been my experience that these, it seems like sometimes like a minor labor dispute you really don't see them going to court until much years later. So if you're a private patrol operator, you're the owner of the security company or a private investigations firm, you're not going to probably get a lawsuit against you, you know, one time that you commit these violations. It's, it's years later. It's $10,000 later, $100,000 later, a million dollars later. Okay. That's, that's what they do. They, they, come into an agreement. I mean, I'm talking about dozens of employees, hundreds of employees, all for a common purpose. And then they end up filing a class action lawsuit. Okay, just the nature of the beast. So under AB 1512, the officer's 10 minute rest period is interrupted. And I'll discuss what that means. The employer must allow the security officer to restart a new rest period as soon as practical. And Augustus versus ABM Security Services defines the word in interrupted for us, and it's defined any time a security officer is called upon to return to performing the active duties of the security officer's post prior to completing the rest period. So it's almost like if, for example, if you have your officers keep their radio on in the lunchroom or wherever it is, you call them and then they answer and you need them to do something, maybe even answer a question. Well, you're interrupting the rest period. You don't want to do that unless you have to. And if, if you need to do it, then you need to compensate them for that. Okay. Of 
Question. What if the officer is not able to take the 10 minute rest period uninterrupted? And I'll give you an answer here. And I'm going to quote it. If on any workday, a security officer is not permitted, and I'm quoting the statutory authority, once again, if on any workday, a security officer is not permitted to take an uninterrupted rest period of at least 10 minutes for every four hours worked or major fraction thereof, then the security officer must be paid one additional hour of pay at the employee's regular base hourly rate of compensation. Before we get to the next part of this presentation, remember, if you're not under a collective bargaining agreement or labor union, AB 1512 does not pertain to you. However, Augustus, that's A-U-G-U-S-T-U-S versus ABM Security Services 2016 case, that case pertains to you if you are interrupted during your rest period. We have AB 2113, which is codified in Business Professions Code 135.4, and this is a BSIS expedited process for refugees, asylees, and special visa immigrant holders. And it's not only restricted to BSIS licenses, you're talking about every license that's under the Department of Consumer Affairs is affected. So you have barber, cosmetology, you might have chiropractic, and just chiropractor. Just about any of the hundreds of licenses are affected. And if you're a refugee, I say like an I say like an asylee and a special visa immigrant holder, then you are able to qualify under this process. Here's the sponsors. Know their names well. And the reason why I give their names and show the pictures is Perhaps you can call them up and thank them for AB 2113, or you could give them a no thank you. So this is how she looks. Blanca Rubio. David Chu. Here you go. What a disgrace. He's standing in front of an American flag and a Californian flag. Both of them are. And Evan Lowe. Again, standing in front of a California flag, American flag, such a disgrace to our nation. Everyone that I name here put Americans last. They put refugees, asylees, and special visa immigrant holders to the front of the line. And I'm, when I mean front, when I'm talking about front of the line, I'm talking about in the front where veterans go. And in the state of California, veterans get expedited process. So in front of the line, you're going to have veterans. You'll have refugees, asylum seekers. Well those who have been given asylum, special visa, visa immigrant holders and Americans that don't fall into that category, who've been loyal to our country, fall back to the back, back end of the line. Jose Medina, Democrat. Lorena Gonzalez, Democrat, all Democrats. Here's how she looks. And last but not least, Wendy Carrillo. There she is. Again, what a disgrace. Sitting in front of an American flag and a Californian flag. Okay, let's go to the next one. AB 685. This is COVID-19 reporting for employers. And it's sponsored by Eloise Reyes. I'm probably pronouncing her name wrong. So I'll just call her Miss Reyes. And she's a Democrat. And... I actually have to agree with this with this bill that she authored and that got signed by the governor. I, I think this is actually a great idea. So within one business day of notice that an employee tested positive for COVID-19 or notified by a health care provider of the condition was ordered by a public health care professional to isol isolate or upon learning of the employee's death, the employer must do the following. And that's notify the public health department. And this is the strange thing here. Oh, by the way, an outbreak is when three employees have been exposed to the coronavirus within a 14-day period and they tested positive. 
Okay, so when they're when they're positive with COVID-19 in a 14-day period, you have to notify the public health department. And this is the strange thing: is you're basically telling the health department that there's an outbreak at your work, and if you're an employer, this is almost like business suicide in a way, because you're telling them, "Hey, we have an outbreak. Would you please close our work site?" I mean, this is what it, it could potentially amount to. So I think that's the strange part of the bill, but I, I, I do think that as employers, we need to notify our, our employees when there's an outbreak as well. And then also there, there is some employee um, notifying requirements. Again, if you have an outbreak, you have to notify the employees and the public health department. It's only fair. Let's talk about Senate Bill 1159, which is codified in Labor Code 6325 and 6432. This is a COVID-19 workers' compensation presumption bill that was signed by the governor. It was sponsored by Jerry Hill. He's a Democrat, and here's his picture. And I actually like this Senate bill that was authored by Jerry Hill. I think it's going to help a lot of employees obtain equity in the workplace. And what it is, is the presumption of evidence for employees. One of the requirements is that the employer has to have five or more employees, okay? And you're going to have to have an employee that tests positive within 14 days of a workday occurring at a work site that is not their home and who tests positive during an outbreak at their workplace. Let me define what an outbreak is. In the context of Senate Bill 1159, an outbreak exists if one of the following occurs within a period of 14 days at a specific place of employment. So if four employees test positive, and this is if the employer has 100 or fewer employees, or 4% of the number of employees who reported to the work site test positive, and that's if the employer has 100 or more employees or the specific place of employment is order closed by a health department personnel or member of the health department or the division of occupational safety and health that's osha or a school superintendent due to the risk of infection of covid 19. okay so there's a pre this the way pre-assumptions work is that if you get COVID-19 under those circumstances, you don't have to prove now that you got it at work. It's a presumption. So the employer, your employer has the burden of proving that you got COVID-19 from somewhere that was not at work. And that's a very difficult burden to prove. Senate Bill 1383 is a new law, and it was codified under Government Code 12945.2, and this expands the CFRA, California Family Rights Act, and it's sponsored by Hannah Beth Jackson. She's also a Democrat, just like everyone else that passed all these bills here, or get, that got all these bills passed by the governor. Here's her picture. I actually like this bill, and again, it brings equity in the workplace. And then here's why I like, is that the CFRA leave has changed now. It used to be, you have to have at least 50 employees in order for you to have rights on the CFRA, but now your employer only has to have five employees within the 75 mile radius. Before employers, what they would do, some of them, they would just have 49 employees. And that's so that they didn't have to abide by the CFRA. Downsizing to five employees is hard. Okay, you, you cannot get away with, with not affording an employee the rights under CFRA anymore. I mean, that's, that's just a, a big downsize. The way it works is you must have 12 months of service and worked at least 1,250 hours in the 12-month period prior to taking CFRA leave. 
Once again, that's the California Family Rights Act. I keep forgetting what the R is for. You also get up to 12 weeks of unpaid family and medical leave for qualifying purposes in a 12 month period. Remember, it's unpaid, unpaid leave. And you are able to continue the same health insurance benefits. You also have the right to a reinstatement to the employee's same or comparable job position. I think this is a really good law that was passed. AB 1867, this is the Small Employer Supplemental Paid Sick Leave Act. And the committee on budget passed it. I don't know specifically who is on that committee, but they got it passed. And it pertains to employers of 500 or more employees. You know, when I heard the term small employer, I'm thinking one employee, two employee, three, four, five, maybe 100, 200, 50, but 500? Okay, so according to the law here, a uh, small employer is 500 or more employees. The employer must provide supplemental paid sick leave. Okay, this is paid. The other laws I just discussed were unpaid. Now this is if the subject, if your area is subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19. If you're in almost every part of California, there's probably a local quarantine or isolation order, okay? I believe Gavin Newsom issued a, a state order not too long ago but the counties tend to issue more isolation orders than the, the state in general. And then you have to be advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine or self-isolate due to concerns related to COVID-19. The doctor's notes that are coming out read to self-isolate for 10 days, 10 to 14 days if you have COVID-19 related symptoms. And that note should be sufficient. Or, okay, this is or, you're prohibited from working by the employer due to health concerns related to the potential transmission of COVID-19, okay? They gotta pay you. Now, I don't know if this is, good, if this is a benefit to a lot of Californians. I don't think that most of the employers in California have 500 or more employees. But if you're likely to be in one, then you get supplemental paid sick leave. Now, I want to I want to make extremely clear that this is a non-workers comp issue. Okay, the other laws I discuss are workers comp issue. This is not a workers comp issue. This is AB 2992 and it's codified in Labor Code 230 and 230.1. This is a domestic violence abuse leave. And Shirley Weber, a Democrat from San Diego, here's her picture, authored this bill. And this bill was signed by Gavin Newsom. This bill actually makes sense. If you're the victim of domestic violence, you should be able to take time off of work in order to do what you have to do to make your family safer, you and your family safer. Okay, so with, if you're a victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, or other violence offense, you could take time off of work, and that's unpaid, or you, you can use your leave, whatever leave you have, sick time, whatnot, depending on the circumstances, obviously. You could take this time off for legal relief, counseling, medical attention, or judicial proceedings. And this includes if your immediate family members were victims of any of these crimes I discuss. You can receive paid sick leave to attend judicial proceedings if you have that paid sick leave. And under the California paid sick leave law, employees earn a minimum of one hour of sick leave for every 30 hours worked per year. Senate Bill 973 covers paid data reporting. And this is Ms. Jackson again, she's a Democrat. She got this bill passed. 
signed by Gavin Newsom, and it requires private employers with 100 or more employees to submit an annual pay data report to the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing. It's the same data that you're going to report as of the as the federal EEO one form, and it covers senior, middle level, and lower tier employees. And you're going to have to include race, ethnic, ethnicity, and sex. I do have a problem with this bill. I don't think that we should have to report what we're paying to employees. Um, I think this is a law that is designed to create workplace equity, but I think that it might pressure employees to hire somebody not based on their qualifications necessarily, but because of the race, ethnicity, and sex, and also with promotion too. I, I think this is a horrible law in the make, making, but I know many will disagree, but that's okay. That's what we're here for. We're here to have intelligent, logical discussions. Okay, we have AB 979. This is the Board of Directors for un, Under represented communities for a publicly held corporation and this is law now you have to have a minimum of one director from under represented community let me talk about what a publicly held corporation is basically a publicly held corporation is a corporation that offers stocks publicly so maybe on the nasdaq or just offers it in some other way if you have a stock corporation you have to have a board of directors and some of you might be thinking well i don't even want a stock corporation no eventually maybe you want to keep growing and you want to get that capital for marketing for different offices or for some other form of growth and to get that capital you issue stocks okay you issue stocks in a public manner and you're able to get that capital, okay? So if you do have a public corporation or maybe you wanna go public, okay? There, there's, there's some security companies that do that. I mean, it's a dime or a dozen, but you're gonna to have to have one person from an underrepresented community. Chris Holden authored this bill and Governor Newsom signed it. Here's Chris Holden right here in the middle, the tallest gentleman, Democrat, and to his right is Vice President Kamala Harris. Mr. Holden's rationale is as follows. He based his rationale on the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics that only 31% of African Americans and only 22% of Latinos worked in management, professional, and related occupations, while 54% of Asians and 41% of whites work in the same occupation. Look, I'm half Asian and I'm half white, and I'm not in management. I'm actually, I'm the guy at the bottom of the totem pole. Okay, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the bottom. So I am not, I mean, this statistic here definitely does not reflect me. Okay, this is the problem that I have is what if you believe I get a I get a lot of people um, from different countries, different religions. I get a lot of um, Muslims and I get a lot of Jews that want to open private security companies. And it's no surprise because in Israel, I mean, those that immigrate from Israel, you're in a you're in a sea or I'm sorry, you're not, you're not, you're basically in an island surrounded by a sea of countries that hate you. Okay. And many Israelis, they know self, great self-defense techniques. They know how to defend their community and others. And they end up coming to America and forming excellent private security companies. Muslims, they're in countries in the Middle East, and they are the victims of a lot of terrorism, 
And because of that, they know how to better prepare than anybody else. I know that the two religions have been at wars for many times, many, many, many years, hundreds of years. Um, but I do get a, a, a diversity of people that believe in different religions, cultures, so on and so forth. Anyhow, just imagine this. You believe in one religion or one, one culture, and then you have to have one director from an underrepresented community, and one of this director is believing in something that you, you highly despise. Well, according to Chris Holden, this is a wonderful idea. Okay. If you're a public corporation, you should already have people on your board. And by the way, you have, I don't know if I mentioned this, but you have to have a board of directors if you are a publicly held corporation. Uh, I just lost my th train of thought. Okay, look. You have to pick somebody that has totally different values than you from an underrepresented community. I, I'm not too sure that's, a, that's something that's fair. But I totally see Chris Holden or somebody else overreaching into other business or areas of business that he has no business being in. Okay. What if he overreaches this great idea into regular corporations, C Corps or S Corps? Okay. What if one of the officers or owners of the corporation has to be a member of an under, underrepresented community? Okay. I just don't like the fact that he he just got a law passed that overreaches into our right our right to remain private privately in a, in our affairs. Just my two cents. We're going to discuss 2021 laws that can have an effect on you guys. If you're new to the channel, I've actually discussed current events that are the catalyst for laws that are signed either this year or next year. I've made some pretty accurate predictions. I've been wrong sometimes, but when I mention that something is most likely going to be a law pretty soon, it actually becomes a law pretty soon. And I restrict my predictions to California and not to the whole United States. I mean, I, I have some ideas on some laws that are going to be passed in the United States, but I don't discuss really that on the channel. I just discuss California issues. So there's Senate Bill 480, and it's this is law. This is signed by Newsom, and it covers law enforcement uniforms. Bob Archuleta, he's a Democrat. He used to be the mayor for Pico Rivera. He authored this bill. Okay, He's a state senator. Here's his face right next to President Joe Biden. And here he is again next to Kamala Harris. And the bill says this. Well, actually, the, the law says this now. It's not even a bill. It's an actual law that Newsom signed. Law enforcement cannot wear a camouflage uniform or a uniform substantially similar to a uniform of the U.S. Armed Forces or state militia. And... This is what Bob cites. He cited a tweet from Aldo Toledo that has 992 followers. And it says this, they have batons out and have zip ties, tear gas and flashbangs in their kits. Some in the background from the sheriff's office are decked out in camo. Bob uses a tweet as part of his analysis of the issue and this discussion is actually in the bill analysis a, a formal government document he he cites a tweet this guy has 992 followers i don't even have close to that right now aldo toledo does but you would imagine at least if you're going to be dumb enough to use a tweet at least use a tweet from somebody that has thousands of subscribers um, hundreds, not some guy that has 992 followers, unless this guy is somebody, somebody reputable. As far as I know, he is a news reporter for, I think he's an ex news reporter for Mercury News. Okay. So he cited a tweet. This is, this is the justification 
for this bill. And then <laughs> Bob gets creative again. He cited an article from a website called Salon. And the art name of the article is Cops, Deadly Identity Problem, How Police Officers' Military Uniforms Affect Their Mental State. I don't even need to say much about that article. It, it's right there. I mean, the title says it all. Okay. I, I don't know what Bob is thinking, but he just has Newsom sign, sign away. I thought long and hard about what I'm going to say about Bob. Um, Bob is a Vietnam veteran. He was a paratrooper in the 82nd um, Airborne. Uh, he was a combat veteran. I, I really appreciate his experience. But the problem, if, the problem of criticizing a veteran is that it, it gets a lot of people upset because this guy did his service, right? His service to the country. Um, he also is a reserve officer, was a reserve officer for Montebello Police Department. And I just want to be accurate again. On his Senate page, it says this. It said, he, meaning Bob, also served with the Montebello Police Department after attending Rio Hondo Police Academy. That's it. Anyone in law enforcement would read this and know that this is a warning sign. Okay, this means that you're you may be hiding something from your page. Okay, because mo most of the time, if you have law enforcement service, you're going to put the dates. Okay, and what exactly you did. So, I looked a little bit further into this, and I learned he was a reserve officer this whole time, but. Why don't you put that on your page that you're a reserve officer? There's a big difference between full-time and reserve. Um, I will tell you that I have a lot of respect for reserve officers that put in the time. Um, they're willing to put their life on the line. Um, but it's it just crazy um, how that somebody can do reserve time and give the appearance that they were doing it full-time as well. And I don't know what Bob did at Montebello Police Department. He doesn't even mention what, what he did. I mean, he he could have had, you know, put in his minimum of two days, um, you know, two eight-hour shifts for a whole year, for 30 years, and then that would probably give him about maybe about two and a half years of full-time service. Why is this so important? Well, first, I, I think... It's just disrespectful for law enforcement in general. Uh, my friend in the police academy, he served honorably in the Montebello Police Department and he died in a traffic collision, one of my academy classmates. And I don't feel like he should be, he, he, he should be able to claim that same experience. I mean, my friend worked hard for that department. What I also don't like is when Bob talks, the state senators, they look at him as a man of law enforcement and a law, man of military. Now, I give him the military part, but just be, just because you do a stint as a reserve, that does not make you knowledgeable in law enforcement procedures. Okay, what I know will blow Bob away. Um, I've done my time on the street. I don't know if he's done his time on the street. He's done his time in overseas, and I really respect that. But just because somebody was a reserve somewhere, you don't give them that, you don't give them that same, um, I like to say that that same credibility as somebody who served a long time in, in law enforcement. Now, what Bob is doing is dangerous because or what he's done is dangerous because you can't look like the active state militia, right? So the active state militia is National Guard. The other day I was at, I was at the border and I saw some guardsmen and I thought, that the guy was actually a, um, I thought it was a maintenance worker, okay? I saw, it was, it looked like the Minuteman on him. I, I'm not sure what exactly it was. Um, looked like a tan shirt and brown, um, brown battle dress pants, okay? Didn't have a gun. Gavin Newsom took away their, 
their sidearms and their M4s, um, depending on the assignment, obviously. But I, didn't, I couldn't even tell that this was a guardsman. You know, Gavin Newsom just wants to satisfy the federal mandate that the border be secured by the state militia. That's probably why he sent an unarmed national, unarmed national guard over there. But that uniform, it can, it, it can be mistaken for maintenance worker or another security, you know, guard for another company. Um, you know, maybe some law enforcement agencies want to use a, a similar pattern, but now they can't because that's a uniform that's used in the act of state militia. Uh, I will say this, that this law does not cover SWAT members or members of uh, special entry teams. They can wear camouflage, any uniform that looks like the U.S. Um, military or, or state act of militia. They can do that, but regular patrol, they cannot wear those types of uniforms. Uh, Coast Guard, I think their uniform looks substantially similar to, well, it looks somewhat like a highway patrol depending on what uniform they're wearing, the new highway patrol uniform. It, it's it's scary because Bob is, is overreaching his influence um, and perceived authority He's overreaching into law enforcement. I just don't think it's right. He has no credibility at all to be discussing the things he did. And Gavin Newsom believed him. He, he just signed, again, he signed away. And it, it's, again, it's insane that it's so far overreaching. Now, if they're going to regulate law enforcement uniforms like this, guess what? You guys that are working private security, you're next. This bill that I'm going to discuss, it's not a law, but it could be. The way Gavin Newsom's been signing anything into law, I wouldn't even doubt that this bill becomes law soon. It's AB 26, law enforcement duty to intervene. This is called the George Floyd Law. You know, Mr. Floyd died in a tragic, tragic incident, but he died in a state that's nowhere near California. I digress. Chris Holden, Democrat, here's his face. He authored this bill. He had to reintroduce a similar bill because that bill died. And this is what the bill tells us. So when there's a use of force incident that appears illegal, maybe a, a police officer is beating somebody with no cause. If there's an officer on ground with this other officer and this person sees what's going on, this person has a duty to intervene. Okay. The law already says that this person has a duty to intervene, but this is where it gets kind of crazy. This person has to report the incident in real time to dispatch or the watch commander. So the officer observing the partner beating somebody, dispatch, Sergeant Smith is beating the subject. I, I need backup. <laughs> I, I don't even know how to even give you an example of this because it sounds so ridiculous. You're supposed to tell the dispatcher um, or the or the watch commander in real time. Okay, it says real time, and real time is a phone call. Phone call, maybe I don't know, FaceTime or something. That's what it says. Okay. And if you don't intervene, look at this. It makes the officer an accessory to a crime if if he or she doesn't intervene. So if you're a police officer, your partner beats somebody kills a person and you didn't intervene, you're going to go down for murder. Okay, murder. And with use of force incidents, there's kidnapping, there's torture, um, false imprisonment. Whatever crime your partner is charged with, you're going to be charged with. There's already a crime in the books that if you don't, that you have a duty to intervene. Um, there's a law that says that. But now you become an accessory to whatever crime the other person's being charged with, okay? This one's a, it's a tough pill to swallow. Um, those of you might be thinking, oh, hey, that's a good idea that, that keeps 
um, police officers on their toes. But if you guys are watching these videos, if you've never been in a use of force situation, then you don't know that using force is ugly. I, you can use any any use of force that you use against another person, another human being, is going to look ugly. There's no way of making force look pretty. It's always ugly. Okay. For the more experienced officers, if you use force, it might look like abuse to the rookie officer or onlooker, but it's not. Okay. Again, it just depends on the type of use of force. Okay. You, it's always ugly. You cannot make it look pretty in front of a camera. So let's just say that you're a veteran officer and you're using a particular level of force on a suspect that looks that looks like it just too much. It looks aggressive, but it's necessary to gain this person to to force this person to compliance. Let's just, let's just say this person has a gun like that's tucked underneath them, right? You see the butt of the gun. You feel they're going to pull it on you. You start kicking them in the face, or the head, whatnot. Well, that looks like abuse, doesn't it, right? Well, if you don't do that, then this person's not going to release that grip. Now, another tactic could be, well, you know, maybe you can go from another um, no, go from another angle and draw down your weapon to see if this person produces a gun. Yeah, you can do that. Okay, that's a, that, there's always that possibility. But what if this is an open street with no cover? I mean, you're gonna you're gonna draw draw your weapon, wait until they draw something else. When you're already on top of this person, or you're within a split second away from them. Okay, so a veteran officer might use a level of force that looks inappropriate and the new officer might think well it's this is inappropriate i need to intervene so this new officer grabs the the older officer or the veteran officer off the the suspect and as a result they both get shot okay it it's it's just ugly and this person okay this rookie officer this new officer is probably thinking well i need to do something because i'm going to be an accessory to crime okay um Chris Holden has probably never set foot on the driver's side of a police car, yet he's creating these crazy laws. What does this have to do with you as a private security professional? Well, guess what? Just wait until we hit the next slide. Everything that is being done against law enforcement that has an effect against the way that police do their job it's going to have effect on you as private security professionals. Just watch. So Chris Holden actually spoke during the October 8th, 2020 BSIS advisory committee meeting. And guess what? When Mr. Holden spoke, Sean Zundall heard everything he had to say. And what he had to say was covered under item 11, and this is pen and use of force legislation for private security. Mr. Holden is creating legislation that's going to affect you guys as private security officers. This is a bill that I actually predicted. And very soon, you just watch, it's going to be introduced onto the floor and Newsom's going to sign it. During the October 8th meeting, Mr. Holden did not disclose what the bill number was going to be or the name of the bill. By doing so, us as private security professionals, it's more difficult to track the bill when he doesn't name it. Okay, we have to wait until he names it um, or he produces a bill number. Okay, now we love to strike these line items before they become bills, but we don't even know what the name of the item is gonna be, okay? Is this a tactic? Maybe, maybe not. It's up to you guys to decide. Final thoughts. I know I discussed a lot of legislation, a lot of bills. I showed you pictures of the legislators that got a lot of these bills introduced. It's not to retaliate against them all it is is to put a name to a picture and a picture to a name. That's it. Okay. 
I encourage you to write these people, email them, call them, and tell them your thoughts. It's about time that Californians be heard. And I don't believe that these legislators have California private security, private investigators, fire instructors in mind.